I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is brought to you by Down East Magazine, the magazine of Maine, and visitnewengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the New London Cultural District Commission. London has seen a lot of changes since its founding in 1645. Thanks to its well-protected deepwater harbor in close proximity to Long Island Sound and the open Atlantic, the city has long served as an important commercial port. During the War of 1812, its well-fortified defenses deterred British attack, and it later became a major whaling hub. Today, numerous ferries ply the busy harbor, transporting passengers to and from Long Island, Fishers Island, and Block Island, while cargo ships deliver all types of products. And more recently, the city has become a staging area for a major offshore wind farm project. The New London waterfront is familiar territory for Captain Scott Arsenault, who skippers the Thames River Heritage Park water taxi. On a bright midfall morning, I met Scott and fellow Captain Luke Arsenault at Fort Trumbull State Park Pier, which also serves as home to the Coast Guard training ship Eagle. So the water taxi itself is a hop on, hop off, kind of a harbor tour. So uh, we have three stops. We have Fort Griswold, Fort Trumbull, and uh, City Pier. And those three stops, people can get on, hop off, they can go do a tour, and catch us the next an hour. As part of their duties with the water taxi, Scott and Luke give tours of the Thames River waterfront. But on this day, their mission was shuttling me and local historian Bruce Buckley to New London Ledge Light for a tour of the iconic lighthouse that sits just outside the river mouth. So Bruce, tell me about how this uh, lighthouse was constructed. Okay, so if you think back 1880, the heat, all the houses are heated with coal. Lots of ships coming in here, hauling coal from Pennsylvania. No lighthouse. They run up on, onto all the reefs in here. So the government in the late 1800s said they were gonna put a lighthouse here at the mouth of the river. So yet, the first thing is you have to understand that this was a home for, prior to the Coast Guard coming on, on board, it was, it, there was a family that lived out here with a light keeper and then in the, the 50s, the Coast Guard came here and lived here, so this was the kitchen. One of the things you're gonna see throughout the lighthouse as we go through all the rooms is that we have added artifacts that were designed to kind of explain how life was here on the lighthouse. If we move into this room, we can have a better look at some of the artifacts and some of the historical items that we've found in uh, the archives down in Washington. You, you just have a perfect journal of what it was like. <laughs> exactly. Photographic it, journal. All 
All right, nice sunny day in the light room. This is the third generation of light. The original was the Fresnel lens, and then that was replaced in 87. Uh, this is LED technology. The, the difficulty when you do tours out here is you almost have to drag them off because this is just, it's mesmerizing out here. I can't think of a more appropriate way to celebrate a tour of Ledge Light than by dining at the restaurant named for the guy who built its foundation, Captain Thomas A. Scott. Captain Scott's Lobster Dock, located on Protected Shaw Cove, is a local institution and serves up mouth-watering seafood, ice cream, and other fare through late October, weather depending. Take it from me, there's no better spot to get your seafood fix on a gorgeous fall afternoon. In terms of its geographic size, New London is relatively small. However, within the city limits are some true outdoor gems just waiting to be explored. One of these is Alewife Cove, a small but important tidal creek shared by the neighboring town of Waterford. It was here that I met up with local writer and avid outdoorsman Steve Fagan for a short kayak tour of the cove, starting at Ocean Beach Park. What I love most about kayaking is how easy it is to get in and out of the water. You hop in the boat and you start paddling and there you are. You're in the water, you can go places where nobody else can go. And uh, you can get up and close to wildlife. There's no other boat that you can do that with. You can stay in the cove, in, in the uh, cove where it's nice and sheltered, protected. It's a little breezy today mm -hmm. and yet we have no trouble at all navigating. Sure. Um, so somebody in a little short plastic boat that just wanted to go out with a family and kids and stuff, they could have a ball. And uh, it's great because we're in an urban center right here. And yet here we are on a beautiful day in, in early fall. Yeah, feel like you're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. Wow, man, Steve, this, uh, this current in this, in this creek is really cranking. Gee, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> no, no, it is, it's moving a couple of knots, so you have to work a little bit harder to get upstream. So we're coming at the, uh, the ebb has begun an hour or so ago, so you can tell we're pushing against the current going up, upstream. Yep, and it, there's some shallow spots, I imagine, you know, in, in, that you have to watch out for, right? There are shallows here. This was a result of Superstorm Sandy in 2012, I think, that... Oh, it filled in? It, it filled, filled in, in a lot of the cove, and they did some dredging then. So we're now, we're paddling where Eugene O'Neill used to paddle. The playwright. The playwright. <laughs> the Pulitzer Prize, Nobel Prize winning playwright. He grew up in New London, and his boyhood home was not far from here. And he and so he would row on, on this... A very stretch of water. Absolutely, took his lady friends uh, <laughs> rowing up here in no the Cove. Yep, we're in hallowed water. You bet. We 
where this is an estuary. It's called a cove, but it's also an estuary. And these are an important breeding ground for all sorts of bait fish. And as I said earlier, everything that's alive, every fish relies on, on bait fish, alewives that come into coves like this one. A driving force behind the effort to restore, protect, and enhance this beautiful waterway is the Alewife Cove Conservancy, led by Edward Lamoureux. It's funny because when you stand here on this embankment now, when I was four years old, five years old, I was in these waters, swimming, fishing, crabbing, having fun. And now my children have grown up here, and now my grandchildren are in these same waters. Everybody loves Alewife Cove. It's Everything you want to be out in nature, you're here in Alwife Cove with it. The Alwife Cove Conservancy is a group of dedicated people. That's Waterford, this is New London. Alwife Cove is the natural border between these two town and cities. But people join together to protect, preserve, and enhance the cove. They love it. So as a conservancy, we're dedicated as an organization to raising funds, to doing the studies, to protect preserve and enhance this beautiful cove. Estuaries and marsh systems like Alewife Cove are critical to the health and productivity of Long Island Sound and the animals that thrive there. Indeed, the Sound itself is technically an estuary, where salt and fresh water mix to create an incredibly diverse and fertile ecosystem. It's a major reason fishing guide Peter Correo chooses to keep his boat at New London's Burrs Marina, near the mouth of the Thames River. From here, he can quickly reach numerous spots around the Eastern Sound to target a variety of species ranging from striped bass to sea bass. But on my late October trip with Pete, false albacore were the main focus. Yeah, so New London is a great jumping off spot because you're relatively close for an inshore fly fisherman or an inshore spin fisherman, relatively close to a lot of good fishing ground, right? So uh, in 40 minutes, you can be to Montauk. In 30 minutes, you can be to Watch Hill. In 20 minutes, you can be to Plum Gut and the Race, some of the more famous places to fish here in Long Island Sound. So you've just got access to all sorts of water. You can fish, fish, uh, uh, in the same day, you can fish stripers in, on flats in three feet of water, or you can go fish uh, bluefish in 200 feet of water at the race, right? So it, there's just, you're close to a lot of action here. And frankly, the fishing is pretty darn good this part of the country, right? We always get a lot of fish. After leaving the marina, we set a course for Fisher's Island Sound in decidedly lumpy conditions. But we arrived to find the Albies present and in good numbers. As per the norm, they proved incredibly difficult to catch, but persistent chasing and casting finally paid off. Oh yeah, right there. Right here. Yeah, right there. That's a lot of birds in here, that's a good sign. Fish right here. That bird in front of you has got him right there, see him? There you go. That's it, come on boys, eat now. Oh, they're jumping right here. Right here, right next to the freaking boat. Got him, got him. You're on. Ha, that's what I'm talking about, baby. Finally, finally. Hang on, he's coming back. Pulling the crazy Ivan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that took a while. <laughs> he, went straight, he went straight down. He... He'll take off when he sees the boat again. He's got one more left in him when he gets close. There he goes. It's the Alby hour. Pretty good size one, actually, looks like. All right, buddy, let's send you back with your pals. Fat, yeah, he's a little, I guess he's about average. He's been eating. I always think that they're bigger, you know? He's been eating, that's for sure. All right, woo! Nice fish, man. Good nice. job. <laughs> Finally, yeah! Oh. <laughs> There we, what's now we know what he's eating. What's he spitting up? He's eating the little bay anchovies, bay anchovies, but a little bit bigger than the snot bait. You want to get him another one? Can we get another oh, one? Oh, sure. Let's right, go ready? get him, right, baby. Gonna, all right, hold on. All right. Pete, sweet job, man. Thanks Finally. For, thanks for putting me on him.
Noting a drop-off in the action, Pete decided to run back west to the waters off Ocean Beach and Alewife Cove. Here we found more feeding fish, and I managed to connect with a second alligator. Here they are right here. Right here at 10 o'clock. It is flat going on out there. All right, I'm in them. You in them? Got them. They're on. Tight. There we go. Tight. <laughs> Got him. Two, two cranks and he was on that thing, man. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh -oh. Trouble. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is that crazy or what? I love it, man. See you gotta run be, right under the boat? You got to be nimble. Is that going nice. on or what? Oh. Yeah, baby! Nice fish. Woo! Yeah. Nice fish. Nice fish. I think the people get so obsessed with false albacore is they can see them pretty regularly, see them under birds breaking. They think that they're seeing false albacore, but they can throw 100 casts at them and not catch them, right? So there's intrigue about finally getting one. Aren't they gorgeous? Beautiful, huh? <laughs> okay. Bye, buddy. That's as good as we've seen it, though. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Still going on out there, Tom. Yep, See yep. Let's get another one. Get another one. Given its long history as a major deep water port, New London is fairly bursting with maritime history. But often overlooked is the fact that the city is also home to one of the country's oldest African American communities. Not far from the waterfront, visitors can explore this important facet of New London's past on the recently created Black Heritage Trail, as I did with historian Nicole Thomas. Our first stop was the Hempstead House, a well-preserved colonial period home owned by Joshua Hempstead. It was also where Adam Jackson, a slave owned by Hempstead, lived and worked from 1727 to 1758. And that actually lived in this house was until was lived here until 1937. 37? 1937. No kidding. Yeah, and she left the house for us. Um, her name was Anna Hempstead Branch. And if you let her tell the story, the house has um, quite an earlier foundation, an earlier start, but we know that Robert Hempstead, Joshua Hempstead, Joshua the diarist, so we call him Joshua the second, but he's Joshua the diarist. Um, he's the one that kept the diary for a period of 47 years. And within that diary, they talk about Adam Jackson, who was enslaved at this house for 30 years. Um, and so it talks about Adam's daily life. A lot of the stuff that's in the house is original. Um, we don't have a lot of Hempstead pieces, unfortunately, but uh, what we do have are, like I said, those family heirlooms, some of the chests and things that Joshua would have had there, some of the things that Adam might have helped to craft, you know? So um, this is a really important site and we know where Adam Jackson would have slept. He would have slept in the garret, which is up here. I mentioned I've slept up there a time or two. Um, is it, is it, it hot in the summer? It is reasonably comfortable in June. However, um, on July and August, I would not recommend it. All right, well, let's go inside. All right, Check it out. let's do it. Well, <laughs> Just very, wash your feet. Very tricky. I know it. I didn't open up that side. We can go in this main room. So this is the main chamber, our front hall, where the Hempsteads would have lived, worked, and slept. Joshua would have had this di this desk here where he would have kept his diary for about 47 years. So he would have been writing about transactional things, daily life, legislative things. Um, you know, he was a justice of the peace and a shipwright. So he would have worked, you know, lived and worked and wrote about all the things that happened in his day. And Adam Jackson would have been part of that diary. He would have been writing about him as well. <laughs> All right, it's one more floor. Are we ready? Oh, wow, this really <laughs> goes up, huh? It's right, yeah. You gotta watch your head at the top. So is, is this where Adam slept? Yeah, Adam would have slept right here in this space in the garret. This is kind of a reimagined space, but we do know, again, based on some of the things that Joshua said in the diary, that this is a space where Adam would have slept as an enslaved man. And essentially, you think about the way Adam would have lived and worked, right? So he probably would have been, the sun goes down, he's upstairs, he's going to sleep, and as soon as the sun is up, where do you think you're gonna get the sun first? It's gonna come right in here, Adam's up, and he's right back to work. Right, 
So now we're standing here in front of 73 Hempstead Street. This house obviously um, looks like a small house, but there was a lot that happened here. Um, the precursor to the Green Book was written here by a woman named Sadie Dillon Harrison. In this house? In this house. So huh. a lot of people are not familiar with that story, but what a lot of people don't know is that it happened right here on Hempstead Street. Right on Hempstead Street. That's right. It's part of the Black Heritage Trail today. That's another thing that we're trying to do is just to keep people engaged, get the youth to learn, and to get people to know these stories so that they can pass them on to future generations. New London's Black Heritage Trail is something that everybody needs to see. I think um, if you're not excited about your history, this is a way to get excited. Um, a lot of people don't seem to, to know that um, you know, a lot of African Americans don't have some of the personal connections. A lot of our stories and histories were lost. And this is a way to reconnect. Even if you start with something that you don't feel like you have a connection to, if you're here and you're grounded and rooted in this community, there's something out there for you to learn. And there's something else for you to take back to your children. And that there's a place of belonging for everybody in New London, especially the black community. We've not just started belonging, we have always belonged here. The Black Heritage Trail is a decidedly urban experience, but to get among some trees, some really amazing trees, head for the northern end of New London. Founded in 1931, the Connecticut College Arboretum is a magical place to walk, picnic, or simply contemplate the arboreal display. It's currently overseen by director Maggie Redfern, who led me on an afternoon stroll through the exquisitely manicured grounds. is 750 acres but we are in a small portion now that's about 30 acres. This is the area that most people think of when they hear about the Connecticut College Arboretum. This is where we focus on growing plants that are native to Connecticut and the whole eastern deciduous forest. Um, plants that are beneficial for the ecosystem, for the birds, for the butterflies, for the bees. Wow, that's a tulip tree? That, yeah. That's a huge specimen of a tulip tree right there. Tulip trees are the tallest of our native deciduous trees. Are they really? Yep. No kidding. People uh, use these trunks to build canoes. Doesn't this look like a, doesn't it look like a tropical plant? It does. So what is this plant? This is a Franklin tree named for Benjamin Franklin. Okay. A good friend of his in the late 1700s was a plant explorer. He traveled all around the United States collecting seeds and plants and sending them back to wealthy people. And this is the one of the this is one of the plants that John Bartram discovered uh, down in the southeastern United States. Very small population of plants. He, I think, collected the seeds. You can tell I like seeds. I like. Uh, <laughs> You're a nut. I'm, yeah, You're I'm a, a nut nut. I'm not a, I'm not a total <laughs> nut. Inside of these little woody capsules are the nuts. They're still maybe a little immature to be splitting open easily, but little stacks of seeds inside of here. Super easy plant to grow from seed. So this plant is extinct in the wild. It's only in cultivation. So only, you're only going to find it in garden settings. Uh, we're standing now in the Arboretum's outdoor theater and we are actually on the stage here. Uh, the audience sits up on the hillside uh, looking down with the beautiful backdrop of the Arboretum pond. In the summertime, a local theater company comes and does Shakespeare in the Arboretum. Uh, we also have concerts here, uh, both community concerts as well as uh, performances just for the students on campus. What I love about the Arboretum and this landscape is how it's constantly changing. And it changes from day to day, it changes from season to season, and from year to year as the trees and the plants grow and die and we plant new plants. I'm just 
just that just that change and being part of that is, is really special. Uh, the Arboretum is open every day of the year from sunrise to sunset, so our hours change just slightly every day. We see a bald cypress tree down here, that bright orange tree. Today, is, that one is just at complete peak color, uh, the bald cypress. Uh, we also have an American larch over there, which also loses its needles, but instead of turning that beautiful orange color, the larch turns a golden yellow. From rare trees to majestic lighthouses, fantastic fishing to peaceful paddling, plus a whole lot of history, New London offers quite a few reasons for the visitor to spend some time in this diverse city on the shores of Long Island Sound. All it takes is a touch of curiosity and a willingness to explore. <laughs>